Okay, hi, I'm Linda Kemp, and I had the great pleasure of being the juror, one of two jurors, for this exhibition. It's the Transparent Watercolor Society of America, and this is their juried exhibition. And I was challenged with selecting 80 paintings out of 613, I have to check my numbers here, 613 paintings. So, now where that might sound uh, like a nice balance, 80 paintings in a show, that's a substantial collection. You have to also remember that in order to get to that 80 paintings, I had to eliminate 533 paintings. And they were gorgeous paintings. And the caliber of this collection is just spectacular. I send out great congratulations to the people that submitted their work to this show. I'm enjoying just looking around the gallery and seeing the work that's here. I'm thrilled with the way it holds together and the variety. And that's something that's important to me when I create a collection or curate a show, as in this case, looking at the artwork, is I want to have a variety of styles and I want to have a great selection of subject matter as well. And not to say that I need to pick something for everybody as far as the viewers go, but I like to have that broad spectrum of styles and visions. And that's really what this is about. And so that did guide some of my selections in the paintings that I chose. So I'd like to take you around the gallery and show you some of the pieces that we worked on together. There were two jurors. We worked independently, and then our scores were tabulated together, and the pieces that had the highest score, we each gave them up to five points, and at the end of the first round of jurying, those that had 10 points, so five points possible from me, and five points possible from my co-juror, Andy Evenson, and those with 10 points automatically were in. And we ended up with, I think, 53 right in our first round, which is outstanding. And then we had 27 pieces to go back and forth to choose the balance of the show. With the collection, we really needed to have paintings that were just, had that wow factor. When you are looking at 613 paintings, there's not a lot of time to waffle. You can't just say, it's not just a, yes, no, maybe I like this one, maybe I'll put it in. It really has to have a high impact. You look at it and you say, yeah, this piece is in, or, oh, this is so sad, I have to say no to this one, but that's the way that it needs to be. And when you're looking at 613 pieces, like what we have here, and you're looking at them, uh, it means a lot have to be eliminated. And so on that sort of balance, Maybe one in nine paintings gets included in the show, and the rest we have to say, uh, sorry, not this time. So let me show you a few of the pieces that I chose, in particular the award winners and why I selected them for an award. You know, I just, I love this piece. And I have the great privilege of jurying a, a lot of shows. And, and that is just such a joy. And, and I appreciate that. And because of our times that we're in right now, and how people are affected by COVID and what that is doing in our lives, there are very often paintings that are submitted that feature something about uh, COVID or, or the wearing of masks. And that is something that I see quite a bit. And, and certainly it's very moving to people. And very often in those paintings, they're, they're quite sad and sentimental. And you see um, sorrow in people's faces. Um, sometimes it's, it's, they feel lonely and so on. But this particular piece 
because of the mask that's on, on our figure, um, we, know it, we know there's a time to this. It's set in history. We know when this is done. And in many, many years in the future, you can look at this piece and you know this was done during COVID times and it, it gives us that sense of, of um, when it was painted. But there's not a sorrow in this piece. It's still very joyous as the person is posing beside the portrait. I love that positioning, the fact that the, the, the subject is looking at us, there's a conversation going on, and I think it is really a spectacular piece. And I just, I love this, and it was very, very moving to see it. And I, I just think this is um, something special. So congratulations for woman wearing, uh, with a mask, woman with a mask. It's gorgeous painting. Let's talk about this beauty. And this is called Blue Ribbon, and it was just this little treasure. Many of the pieces in the collection are fairly substantial. They're fairly large. However, this is just a small piece. Uh, for watercolor painters, you know it's actually less than a quarter sheet here. It's, it's um, uh, just a little treasure. And it is called Blue Ribbon. It is just a very intimate little moment that has been captured. It's especially sentimental to me because I grew up with horses and did showing. So when I came across this, it evokes a memory. It's a special time. And the painter has been very direct with the color. It's just applied, nice brush work, nice and loose and fresh. And it's almost like a colored sketch. So it, it really is a, a, a lovely little treasure. painting here, wave two. Um, I knew from judging that it was kind of a small painting and uh, but it's just despite the fact that it's very subtle it's still very powerful that image of the crashing wave um, just that, that was one of my favorite paintings um, in the whole show when I was exhibit or when I was um, selecting it online uh, I wasn't sure it would make it in so I'm very happy to see it in here and um, represented in TWSA because it's, um, it's not often that you see something um, just kind of a simple, powerful image like that with a lot of subtlety in it. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of these big shows are kind of dominated by big, you know, much more splashier um, paintings. So um, I, I really appreciate how difficult that painting must have been to create. Um, again, the value difference, even the, the darkest darks is like a middle value in a lot of my paintings. Um, so it's not this you know, screaming for attention kind of a painting, but it's just so, so well executed. The softness of the splash up here, the lost horizon going off into the distance, um, you know, the, the green that you always see in the, in the waves kind of coming into that warmth down here. Um, just making a star of the show out of a, of a big breaking wave, I think was a very bold thing to do. Um, and, you know, in general, I always kind of complain about the need to put little birds and things into paintings all the time. But in this case, I think those little seagulls added quite a bit. Um, they're not overdone, again, subtle. Just little touches of those birds up flying up above um, added a lot. So congratulations to Lilia. I think that's such a beautiful, beautiful painting. Um, um, this is almost just a, an abstract painting. Um, the design and composition of it all, um, a representational painting, but you know, all good paintings should have good abstract qualities too, even representational paintings. It, that's you know, making sure you're thinking about line, composition, form, um, you know, contrast, balance, all those kinds of things. And um, 
you know, just kind of choosing this little light struck area up there where the highest contrast is, the light on the rocks, the dark up here above, um, all the shapes kind of leading the viewer's eye up in there. Very wonderfully designed and executed painting. I like that one a lot. Beautiful colors. Um, these two florals here, um, you know, quite striking contrast, but again, one of the things I love about them is too often you see flower paintings that are really tight, um, but both of these just have such, a, you know, flowers are living, just like that portrait, I was Stephen Jane's portrait I was talking about, it's a living entity, okay, and, and the fact that both of these have great energy, softness, um, you know, they're not... They're not um, handled with a bunch of hard edges. That's just a beautiful, glowing floral painting. And again, um, you know, this, it's incredible the confidence and skill it takes to paint something like that. That, with that much energy, you know, these, ne these were not masked out. Those, those, those interesting negative shapes were, were painted around. That's why I was having us practice negative shapes before, the importance of that, okay? All of these interesting little white shapes that they have in there created. Um, it's not something that you can, you can plan ahead for a little bit, but so much of it is just the energy of executing that painting rapidly and confidently and not having to go in and fix edges of shapes, okay? Um, so it's exciting to see a floral painting with that much energy in the show. Blue boats, gorgeous, gorgeous color scheme, great execution. Remember what I was saying um, downstairs with the figures, the group of figures, how you can kind of pick out one or two and paint them and the rest can be just kind of indicated. We know there's a bunch of boats in here. How much, how much more distracting would it have been if he had all this detail that he had in a couple of these boats and all of them? Okay, we know that there's more boats there. This is just a big shape. There's a little bit of suggested detail in there enough um, to show that there uh, are more boats. But the fact that this one, leading the viewer's eye in, was handled a little bit more uh, proficiently and, and accurately um, coming up towards the viewer. The viewer's eye kind of comes up through the figure, the little rigging lines going up into the background area, okay? All that kind of stuff is important to think about when, when you're talking about design and composition, creating that visual pathway through the painting. I don't like that term focal, air or focal point 
Um, it's just kind of too restrictive. I always use the term area of interest, and it's okay to have a few areas of interest. Generally, you want you know one area of the painting to be a little bit more um, dominant. But I, I like the uh, more of an idea of a pathway through the whole painting that the viewer can kind of follow to, and start to see little areas um, the more you explore. Obviously, when you look at this, you go right to this gentleman um, over the boat here. But there's a lot of beautiful, little interesting shapes that these two figures are so well handled um, and executed. And even these little shapes up here, the shape of that boat, one quick little dry brush stroke for the edge of that boat. Again, you can't do that slowly and, and get that kind of a mark. That's just confidence and execution, being able to do that. Same as all these little rigging lines, being able to get those in there. So that's a beautiful painting. And this one. And this one, too. I mean, that's, again, the, the stories that kind of take place. I wish, I wish every one, one of these paintings came with, you know, a page what the you know describing what the the artist was thinking about or the story because it's hard it's difficult sometimes for us as a viewer we appreciate the beauty of it all but this one just feels like there's some kind of a mysterious background story to it that we don't know but that lends to the charm of the painting I think you know it makes you take a little deeper dive when you're looking at it and try and understand what this lady is feeling uh, what's happening in her life beautiful painting And McCartney's painting, uh, you know, at first glance, this almost looks like a, a photograph. But again, when you, that's the trick, and that's some of the things I've been talking about in the workshop, having these convincing forms. And remember how I'm always saying, you know, they need to read well from far away. So from where you're standing, that almost looks like a photograph. But when I get up close to this painting and really, you know, kind of study the forms of the, the portraits of Marilyn Monroe and things up on the ceilings, the way she was able to simplify and break down all those forms into just their basic elements. It, it's almost, again, that light side, shadow side kind of a thing that we're dealing with in here is just remarkable. Um, one of my favorite British painters, John Yardley, does these interiors, and I'm always commenting about how much I love the, the paintings of paintings that he does in the interiors and how he handles them so you know it's an oil painting, it's either a landscape or a portrait, but when you look at it, there's not that much detail. And it's the same thing, the way she handled all this um, chaos on the board behind the bartender here is pretty remarkable. I love that, it all holds together. Together. And then, you know, continuing with the theme of light side, shadow side, um, this painting here, just really, look at all the information is in that one little bit of rim light on these figures. That's, that's incredible. We get a sense of the, the age of these people, you know, what their personality is, what they're, they're doing at this time. And 90% of those figures is just the shadow side, the color side. So that, that little bit of rim light, you know, on those figures, um, once again, just kind of talking about the importance. Remember what I was saying, that little uh, anecdote about the power of the silhouette that I told you before. You know, we, my wife and I could see, pick out our kids in the art project just by the shape of their head. Um, so, you know, just being bold enough to not feel the need to come in there and put more texture in those shadow areas. Um, you know, that's really important. In, in general, when you're working on paintings, you want to have, um, you know, the focus either in the light or the shadow, okay? And in general, the shadow areas are usually um, a little more vague, you know? Uh, again, in general, sometimes if it's a really bright, strong light that's like blinding light and washing out the detail in the sunlight, you're going to have more interest in the shadow area as a result. But um, it, it's really important to kind of keep the focus on one or the other. And the, all the little bits of detail and color and things are in the, the little bit of rim light on these figures. And then again, that big, beautiful, luminous wash. And, and you know, somebody asked me before, earlier in the workshop, you know, do you always just use, you know, dark paints gray or something for your darks? No, you, there's color in darks, okay? And this is an incredible, <laughs> example of how you can go really dark with things, but it doesn't have to, it's not even approaching black, okay? Uh, that's a, an amazing painting. I love that, the luminosity, very well executed.
So this is a, a painting by Christine Merrick Byrne, and it, I'm sorry, this is a painting by Christine Merrick Bunn, and it is called Determined. And you can just see, even though there's not a lot of time spent on getting all the details perfect in the face, there's such a look in the character, the head is down, you're walking, and we can feel the coldness. We know that this person is headed in a direction, something is on their mind, and they are focused on getting somewhere and achieving something. And it's, it's just lovely. The colors that are used in the snow are wonderful. So often we think about snow being white, but when you look at this, you see how much color the artist has included in the piece in order to get that feeling of light and shadow. It's, it's a beautiful piece. And I just love the posture and that, that feeling that so many of us have experienced where we're, we've got something on our mind and we're moving in a direction, and that's where it is. This was another one that I remember looking at, going back to what I was saying about, I like to be surprised, you know? I, I, I like to see all the, the technical expertise in, in these, you know, highly detailed paintings. Uh, but, you know, the, the subject that this artist chose here was just so unique. And um, again, you know, living in Wisconsin, growing up in Wisconsin and living in Minnesota, something we're all familiar with. But um, it, it just amazes me how it feels like you could just you know, crunch that and hear, hear the sound of the, the leaves on those corn stalks um, crunching underneath you. And the color choices are beautiful. Um, the design and the composition is gorgeous, you know, kind of focusing on uh, not having too much of the corn cobs themselves. I like the fact that they focused on this part of the corn cob and not all the kernels. There's enough of it, obviously, to, to add the visual interest, but it's almost like they're just falling off the bottom of the page, you know. That's gorgeous, really beautiful painting. Moving on down here. Again, something unique, you know, this landscape. I, I would never, I don't even know idea, what was he, was he in scuba gear, you know, going down there to get this reference photograph? That's just crazy, but um, it's, it's just really fun. After a while, you know, during shows and seeing shows year after year, it's, it's important to find a unique take on things, okay? And that's um, one of the, some of the best advice I can give you when you're trying to get into the shows. Um, I know the, the, um, the, the temptation is to kind of, you, you see what's been accepted into a lot of shows and it kind of creeps in the back of your mind, you know, this kind of painting works, maybe I need to do that kind of painting to get into a show. But personally, I'd rather see somebody go off the beaten path, you know, and do something completely unique. And I've never seen a painting like that before. Um, so not only is it just the scene itself, but again, the composition, the design of everything, the, the, the light up here in the upper left corner um, going through everything, the handling of the textures is just amazing. Uh, it all, if you squint at it a little bit, it all holds together well, the big shapes and the values, despite the fact that multiple, multiple colors, you know, and everything. But overall, the value shift inside some of these big shapes is very minimal, okay? So they're shifting color, but the value is staying awfully close together, so they still read together as, as large, convincing shapes. I love that painting, too. Stephen Zhang's portrait. Again, I like to see, um, I love to see a portrait with energy, okay? Um, obviously, that, that figure's not moving. I talked about that earlier. You know, when you have people in your landscapes, how important it is to make sure they don't look stiff. Um, but this guy's just sitting for a portrait, and he still looks like he's a living, breathing human being, okay? Just because of the energy of the brushstrokes, that, that painting is just incredible. Nothing is tight and overworked. I mean, you, obviously, you go right down to the the handling of the sweater and the fabric and, and the hat and the background and everything as far as the big brush strokes. But when you look even in the face, there's energy in all those little um, smaller shapes as well. Um, that's just a, really a beautiful glowing portrait. Um, and the fact that all the warmth is up there around his face. 
pay attention to, that's another thing, um, flesh tone, okay? Uh, how people just kind of go way too pale with things all the time. Look at the value and the color in the neck area, especially of this, this guy's chin. And we know it's the same, you know, obviously the same kind of warm, sun-baked skin as you have up there in the light. But that value contrast and having the, the guts to go that bold and dark and colorful in the shadow area under the chin, that's what makes that painting pop, okay? If you don't go that strong in some of these areas, that light isn't gonna be as effective up above. Really gorgeous work. Man, I wish I could paint like that. And another great example of that kind of a figure. Going, going um, again, the darkness, uh, the, the contrast and the, the leathery face there and having the, the guts to go that dark on the flesh tone. <clears throat> <clears throat> Speaking of guts, you know, how many of us would have a composition where there's just a big branch going right across the front of the composition, you know, but in a way that's, that's really important to show depth. It's hard to visualize what that painting would look like without it because it's so dominant in there, but, um, you know, the, that bright um, oak branch coming through uh, with all those bright colors helps to give even a greater sense of depth to the whole painting as this figure is walking into the woods. Um, the, the whole contrast, not just of size and shape, but value and color and everything. Um, so it was really important, I think, um, the way he designed that painting. That's something uh, I've seen a lot of John's paintings. That's a pretty unique one for him. So this is a really large watercolor painting, and it's by John Salomon, and it is called Autumn Serenade. It is just gorgeous treatment of the surface. There are so many little filigree and activity happening within the surface. It's got mystery, intrigue, deep space. It's just lovely. It feels like a walk and into a magical place. Gorgeous color. It's a wonderful painting. Um, and this painting as well. Um, I can't imagine the, the time that went into creating this painting. Um, and again, the guts, I would have been, the temptation would have been for me to just kind of leave a lot of that empty. But the fact that um, even despite all the detail work in here, um, it's still working fine because of the, the color choice, okay? Making sure all the, the, the bright colors is on the figure. And, um, you know, it's really a, a painting about pattern and shape um, and design. And, um, yeah, all the, making sure that the, all the perspective of these rocks are going up and towards our figure here. But um, really impressive. And, oh, my goodness, looking at that crown up close, I didn't have a chance to do that online either. Wow, that's my favorite part of the painting. If you get a chance later, come up and look up close at that. The colors right in here are just amazing in that little shadow area. And that's going back to what I was talking about. This, you know, a lot of these areas are, are tighter, obviously, in small little um, bits of color. But those exercises that we were doing downstairs where you're just kind of changing the color on your brush to paint that shadow shape, that's, that's what I'm seeing up there. I just love that. Wow. That's a nice landscape too. And that's, um, you know, and again, I keep kind of contradicting myself about, you know, how to show that strong, feeling of strong sunlight with contrast. But, uh, you know, this is a, a good example of creating that nice feeling of strong sunlight without having to go overly dark in the shadow areas. You know, you still get that feeling of sunlight bouncing around in this valley off the rocks and up off of the water. Um, so, and, and I love the little misty you know, that little vagueness coming down here into the trees, creating some of those lost edges. You know, the nice complementary color scheme of the violets and golds also adds a great energy to that painting. But um, this is an example of what I was talking about before. You know, a lot of times shadow areas are vague and, and light is where the interest is. In this particular painting, 
there's not much interest in the light. The sky is kind of a washed out blue. The rocks are kind of all washed out because the sunlight is so strong. All the interest is in the shadow area in this one. So it was important in this case that they didn't have a lot of you know, color and interest in, in the light area. It all would have been competing for attention. So this is an, a good example of making the shadow area the star of the show and not the, the light area of the painting. Just a really interesting concept, very well executed by Ken here. Um, you know, a figure painting, but a, a figure in motion, um, trying to capture that figure going through. It's just got so much mystery to it, the, the surroundings of the ballerina. What is this ballerina doing in, a, in an abbey at midnight, <laughs> you know, bouncing through? Um, again, trying to find something unique to say and a unique way of presenting it. Um, everybody in here is a skilled painter, obviously. So what sets some paintings apart and others not? It's not just the technical expertise, okay? It's, it's um, having a voice, like I said, and, and finding a unique way to present um, your ideas to the, to the viewer. And this is just a really, I, again, I haven't really seen a painting like this um, before either. It's very striking. I like the way he handled that. Um, and this one, for being so tight, um, tightly handled, um, I love, it, it still has great energy in the water, all these shapes, but that decision to make that glowing shape up here, once again, if I kind of block that out uh, with my hand, I think it, you know, the rest of the painting is still gorgeous, um, but that decision to make that bright sunlight glowing up there to kind of offset the, the figure a little bit as it, and then obviously reflect it down below um, was a really gutsy choice and made a big difference, I think, in, that, in the execution of that painting overall. Um, it still would have been a very beautiful work, um, despite, you know, without that, I mean, but um, I think the addition of that glow really kind of set that one off. Okay, so this particular painting, it's called Blue Butterflies. It is exquisite. And because we're working quickly in order to go through 630 paintings, uh, you don't have very long to look at each painting to say yes or no to it. I have just not had enough time to look at this painting. Not to say that I didn't look at it for a long time, but I could look at this painting for, for ages. There is so much to see here. There are so many beautiful things happening in the design, in the exquisite flesh tones, the character, there's mystery going on here, and it's, it's truly a magical piece, and I just love it. I think it's a, a, a beautiful little painting. It's a, it's a beautiful painting, just wonderful. Great composition choice here again. Okay, the portrait. I don't know how she got that on there, but um, obviously, once again, beautifully handled the, the textures of the hair, the color differences that you're seeing, the value and temperature um, throughout the whole thing. But um, the, the fact that um, she kind of chose that composition choice and, uh, and design uh, really makes a difference in that one too. 52 and change, she's trying to look up at, the, at her future, I guess. So, so many amazing paintings in here. I mean, like I was saying, this the TWSA has kind of the reputation for a lot of highly representational pieces, and it's just, um, you know, it's easy to just go on and on and on about the technical expertise that it takes to create these things, but um, wow, that scarf, that's another one that I didn't get a chance to really appreciate up close, I have to, have to judge it online. Um, I think most of these, I was only one of the jurors' selection, but I'm happy to see that a lot of my favorite ones made the cut. It looks like uh, Linda and I were on the, same, on the same page for the most part. This is really interesting too, uh, the, the decision to kind of leave the background white, make these, uh, these strong figures, you know, they're, they're trying to present this look of these two strong young ladies staring at the viewer, uh, kind of front and center on there, skateboard in hand. I like that too, the Zoltan Zabo Award, Scott. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Anybody know? Ponamon? Ponamon? Yeah, nice works.
uh, this painting over here um, by Karen Schaff. But one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, how important the fact that this was all just kind of left empty, okay? Very important compositionally, design-wise, with all that's going on down here. Uh, just incredible handling of the facial features, the flesh tones, um, everything is just so convincing. The little busy area down here, the painting with all the bright colors. So, you know, thank goodness there wasn't wallpaper or a table or something else up there, you know, just so that, that whole concept of design and composition um, is really important. And I think that's what sets a lot of the, some of these paintings uh, apart from others um, without being too busy because a scene like that, you know, painted realistically could obviously get very busy. I love, I like to be surprised also when I'm looking at paintings and, um, you know, just this, I have a friend, um, Jeff Larson in Minnesota, who always kind of chooses these odd objects, you know, kind of antique things and paints them realistically. I never would have th think to, to paint them, but um, again, I just love the uniqueness of this front and center, like a portrait of this, this uh, old gumball machine or whatever the heck it is, um, something from all of our past, but it's un unbelievably executed here. Um, one of my favorite of all the paintings when I looked at them was um, this one with the, the album covers. It just, I, I was just stunned at how realistically th they handled all these torn edges of the album. I mean, just coming up to this and being able to see it in person, unfortunately, you know, judging the show online, I could zoom in a little bit, but um, coming in here and actually being able to see the size of this painting and, and what a fabulous job this artist did of, of making, again, you know, kind of a surprise. I like, you know, it's not just fruit and things on a table, you know, as far as a still life. Um, that painting just blew me away right when I saw it. So um, really well done on, on all that. And again, kind of the, um, not getting too carried away with um, the, the words on there um, that could have really taken over things, but your, your brain doesn't, or your mind doesn't get, um, you know, too distracted by all the the titles on the albums just because of the rest of it is handled so beautifully. Um, that's really tricky to do. I usually tell my students, don't put words on signs, you know, or, or on buildings or things because that your brain just kind of goes right to that right away. A stop signs, you know, just kind of indicate it a little bit. But the fact that this artist was able to really put the names on all those albums and it doesn't bother me at all, again, just speaks to how well the, the rest of the painting was executed. When I go through the slides, when the paintings come in to me, all 613 of them, the first thing I do is go through every painting without making a decision. I just look and I move on and I, I make a, a, a quick glimpse and then I move forward just so that I have an idea of what the collection includes or could include, what I have to look at. And as I'm looking through them, um, I move quite rapidly through, and then I take a break. And when I come back from that break, and I begin the process of deciding what is going to be included and what isn't going to be included, certain paintings stay with me. And I'm waiting for that painting to come up again in the series of slides that I'm looking at. And this particular painting, it stole my heart right from the first view. And when I went back through the slides, I couldn't wait for this to come back again so that I could spend time looking at it and I could say yes to this piece. Because at first glimpse, I knew this piece needed to be in the show. It is beautiful, stunning, it captures a moment. The, the filigree of lace through this area is so beautifully painted and it's special even though it, it's a still life and we had lots of still life come in and to catch me off guard with a still life by putting in an element that's a surprise or something different something personal in the still life is really what captures my heart and in this case We've got all these wonderful bottles and glass, but it's this little 
wren that's in here that is just so delightful and it does feel magical. And so that is why I chose Emerald City by Mary Jansen for a very special award. And I, I just love it. I think it's, it's exquisite, beautiful piece. I love this piece. I love this piece. And I, I don't need to explain a whole lot about it other than the fact that this is everyday life that's captured. And I don't know whether this person, I think she's working in a, a restaurant, she's got her orders here, and it's just capturing that moment in a day where the, uh, something is being prepared, the colors are wonderful, the position is wonderful. It's just a, a delightful piece and these flat layers of color. And I, th I think it's just wonderful. All of these pieces are so spectacular and it's difficult to walk by and not want to talk about each and every one of them because every piece in this collection deserves to be here as does a number of paintings that unfortunately were not able to be included just because my job was to reduce the number of 613 down to 80. And so I really had to look at the pieces and say, oh wow, this is just spectacular. It had to be more than just thinking it's a good painting or even a great painting. It had to have that wow factor that, that I just didn't want to turn it away, and I did have to turn away a number of really wonderful pieces. And I'll tell you, the last 10 pieces that I had to say sorry, not this time to, that hurts to have to, to not be able to put them in because I know how hard artists work to prepare and put their heart and soul into a painting that they know is a good painting. I had the pleasure of talking to uh, Dean Mitchell, who won the top award. This is called Dancing Shadows. And we talked about that feeling of when you, when you know that peace is there, when it is complete, when it has achieved that special feeling that you're after, and it just sits right and you are excited to enter it into an exhibition and have the opportunity to present it. So this particular piece is just mesmerizing the color combination, the lightness of touch, the exquisite play of value, and the sunlit feeling that's on the building and capture a little bit of color. So we've got a lot of neutral colors going in, but there's little hits of pure color here and there that absolutely sing. And it just makes it an exquisite piece. And I was thrilled to be able to see it and to be able to give it this award. Um, I, I think it's wonderful. And so congratulations to everybody who had their pieces accepted in the show and to the people that unfortunately were not included. It doesn't mean that your piece wasn't wonderful and that I didn't love it. It's just I couldn't include them all. And so we had to make this balance between pieces that have a variety of style, a variety of subject matter, and something that's unique and truly special, something that has sticks with you and you want to see it again. So I hope you come to the show and see the show and see what we saw. And, and maybe you'll love something that I've chosen and there'll be others that you look and say, oh, I wonder why she picked that or Andy picked that. And uh, so that's, that's all part of what art is about. So thank you very much. It was great to be able to jury the show.